Amen. Praise His holy name. The blood that Jesus shed for us. Well, aren't you glad you came to worship today? To be in God's presence and sense His nearness. What a sweet spirit. What a sweet spirit here today that God is near. Father, we worship you and we come before you with open hearts and open minds, open spirits for you to speak and for you to have your way and for us to hear and not only just to hear with our hearts and hear with our minds, but to hear with our, our feet and our hands to go out and to live what you would say to us. So help us to get smart today, trusting in you, seeking your face and living out our faith in everyday life. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, today I want to share with you, and I, and I try to do this every week, I, I always want to share a practical message with you. I always want to give you something that you can take home with you, that you can use, that, that you can apply, that it's not just a bunch of information, though I like to give a lot of information, and you notice that. And so you have an outline today with eight points on it, okay? Now, really, it's just one message with eight subpoints. So there's just, it's just, I'm going to work through those pretty quick today, but, but the goal today is we're walking through the book of Proverbs over the next several weeks, is to see what God would say to us of how to live a smart life. How do we live a life pleasing to God and a life that God will bless, a life that God will use, a life that, that, that does what God calls us to do. And the book of Proverbs lays out for you and me some very clear steps, some very clear guidelines of what to do and what not to do. Matter of fact, it says if we do these things, we're wise, and if we don't do them, we're foolish. If we follow God's Word and listen to it and obey it and, and apply it to the situations of our life, He says that we're going to be blessed, but if we don't apply it to our life, if we don't follow it, if we act in ways contrary to His purpose and a plan, then we are living in folly. We're, we're fools. Have you ever gotten in trouble because of a bad decision that you made? Have you ever found yourself, um, uh, you know, we call it kind of foxhole Christianity, where you've, you've been in a place of going, oh, God, if you'll just get me out of this one, if you'll, just, if you'll just help me through this trial, through this difficulty, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make every decision right. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to even wear a tie. Okay, you won't do that, guys, will you? I'm, I'm going to do what you say I'm gonna, I, I need to do if, if you'll just get me out of here. Yeah, I think the truth is every single one of us have been there. Oh, God, help me. How did I get here? Why did I make that bad decision? What, what am I going to do to get out of this thing? But I'll make wiser decisions in the future, God, if you just get me through this. Would you agree with me that making wise decisions, that's, a, that's an important skill to develop? Don't you think so? to be wise in, in what we do. And, and one of the reasons is, is because our decisions determine our destiny. The decisions you make and, and I, day, I make our next tomorrow, our next year, our, our, our years to come, our destiny is largely determined by the choices that we make, largely determined by what you do and what you don't do. The choices we make, the choices we don't make. And, and often the difficulties of life or the not difficulties of our life are largely determined by the choices that we have chosen. Some of you today are here facing some big decisions. You're facing big decisions when it comes to careers. You know, do I take the job? Do I not take the job? Can I find a job? You know, do I, do I move forward in the job or do I retire from the job? Some of you are facing some big decisions when it comes to relationships. Do I date him? Do I not date him? Do I marry her or not marry her? Do I, do I work this through or do I walk away? And there's all kinds of decisions. Some of you are, are married and you're making decisions about family. Do we have kids now or do we have kids later? Well, we can't have kids. And so what do we do? Do we adopt or do we have, you know, in vitro fertilization? What do we do. Or those of you who have kids, your kids are going back to school, and do we send our kids to public school, or do we send ourselves to private school, or do I homeschool? You know, I was not a good student, but maybe I can homeschool and, and help my kids and give them that extra care that they need instead of just mainstreaming them. All kinds of decisions. 
what does God say about this? What does He want me to do? How does He want me to, to act? Some of you are young mothers. I've had a number of young mothers come to me just recently and say, you know, I've, I, I've had my baby and my kids are young, but do I stay home? Do I have my husband work and do I spend time with the kids for a few years before they go off to school? Or do I, I like my career, I like doing what I'm doing, do I, do I keep doing that? What do I do? Who's going to watch my kids? A lot of choices that, that not only impact your life, but impact the lives of those around you. And the good news is today we're going to look at some insight from the wisest man of the world, whoever lived. Matter of fact, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit when he wrote these Proverbs down, and we put them in a book called the Holy Bible, the inspired Word of God, and we can look at that and gain his insight and his wisdom and help us make good decisions. Well, how do we make, how do we make good decisions? Here's what I know. Making good decisions is not necessarily based on intellect. It's not basically, it's not necessarily the result of good intuition. Well, I just kind of feel it. I, I, I don't know. I can't explain. I can just, it's not necessarily that. Intellect is not the, the result of, of just stuff around us. Wise decisions is really the result of a predictable process. Some questions that we ask, some places that we look for answers. And, and what I want to do is walk you through just... Eight simple questions this morning, very practical, about your life and my life. Questions that I seem to be asking almost every day, one or more of these questions. Things that I face and, and talking with many of you, situations that you face. And how do you make a wise decision? And I want you to take your Bibles, if you would. And I want you to turn over to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Now, I'm, I've kind of shocked you a little bit coming back from working on my doctorate because I've, I've, I've really made life easy for you in past years. Matter of fact, ever since I can think of it. And I've always put the scripture up on the screen. And all you have to do is just exercise your eyes by just looking up about that far. And some of you have a really strong neck muscle because you're just, mo and your eye muscles are really good just to do this. But you don't know how to do this. And so we're going to exercise those muscles today. So stand with me, would you? Take your Bible, open it up, turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 3, and looking at verse 13, let's develop that muscle. But the reason I'm going to do that now is I'm just going to list out a reference. I love having the scripture on the screen because it makes me look like I'm smart because I just espouse the scripture. I just, I read it off the back screen and you go, man, he has the Bible memorized. Well, I don't have the Bible memorized. I have a lot of verses memorized, so I'm, okay, I'm not as smart as you thought I was. Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. I don't know about you, but I like that word joyful. I would much rather laugh than cry, unless I'm laughing so much that it makes me cry. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, who gains understanding, for wisdom is more profitable than silver. And, and who isn't into a profit? I mean, I, I want to get a good return. Profitable. It's more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Have you seen the price of gold lately? That's a pretty good thing, isn't it? Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. She offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. What an embrace. She will guide you down delightful paths. All her ways are satisfying. Ah. That just makes you want to just... Ah. All her ways are satisfying. Satisfied. In other words, if you make good and wise decisions, then your paths will be satisfying. It's not going to be always easy. Sometimes it's difficult, but it's always satisfying. But if you make foolish, poor choices, then life is tough. So how do you make good decisions? May God bless His Word. You may be seated. Thank you. 
What I'm going to share with you are these eight questions that when you're faced with the decision, when you're faced with the choice, when you're faced with a, a situation, you've got to make up your mind. What are some process, what are some questions that you as a believer, you as a Christian, you as a Christ follower need to ask? The first question is this. What does God say? What does God say? You know, if we're a follower of Christ, if we want to be fully devoted followers, if we want His blessing, the very first question is, what is God saying? What's God's perspective? Not what I feel, not what everybody else is saying, because the truth is that we often, when we're faced with decision, we put finding out what God says kind of down the list. But if we love God, and if we want to serve God, and we want God to bless us, that becomes priority number one. What is God saying? about this decision, this question that I'm dealing with. Not what is most expedient, but what does God say? Proverbs chapter 28, and I've listed these verses out in your outline today, but I encourage you to take your Bible and open up to these different passages, and I've listed the reference there on the screen. Proverbs 28, 26 says this, He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. Have you ever made a foolish decision by just relying on your intuition? It, it just feels right. And, and sometimes you may have even thought it was God speaking to you, but maybe it was a financial decision or a relational decision, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. I'm not going to give any personal illustrations because i got too many. It just seemed like a good idea at the time, but it was foolish. And the truth is God wants us to make as few of those as possible. And he wants us to trust in him. Because the struggle is this. When we get impressions, let me tell you what impressions are. Impressions are impressions. That's all. Most impressions are just impressions. Not necessarily God speaking. Sometimes we sense God, but we confirm it in his word. We ask for godly counsel. But, but most of the time, impressions are impressions. You know, the night before I got married, I got an impression. Run! And what I discovered is over the years, most guys the night before they get married have the same impression. And what I've also discovered is women have the same impression about a week after the marriage. You can't always rely upon impressions. You can't always just say, well, well, it just feels right, and so that's what I'm, I'm going to do. You need more than a gut feeling. You need to say, what is God saying? What is His Word saying? Well, how do you find out what God is saying? What, what do you find, how do you find out what His Word says? There's, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of, of biblical interpretation and hermeneutics and all of the good stuff right here, how to discover God's will. And it's really based upon four different words. One is this. You look at God's Word and see if He has a command. That's the first thing. And I put it on your outline. You can underline that word, command. Is there a command where God says, do this? And if God says, do it, then you are to do it. Now, if God says, don't do it, you're to not do it, right? Case closed. It's over. The question's done. Decisions, it's finished. God says, do it. Well, I do it. God says, don't do it. I, okay, I'm not going to do it. Don't commit adultery not going to do it. Don't steal. I'm not going to do it. Don't lie. I'm not going to do it. And, and so I make up my mind right there. What is God saying? Is there a command? But what if I'm asking a question and there isn't a command? Then I look for a principle. A principle may be a principle of generosity, a principle of relationship, a, a principle of, of how to deal with people, being kind or being considerate or being wise and watchful not allow people to deceive me? Is there a principle there? So if you can't find a command, you can't find a principle, then, then what you look for is a liberty. Does God kind of say, it's okay, do what you want? It doesn't matter because it, it's, it's wide open, it's in between my will here, I've got what my will is right here, you're in the middle of it, and you, can, you have all this room, just go for it. So if there's no command, there's no principle, there's a liberty. But the last word is this, responsibility. Because not everything, well, let me say it this way. This, I'll just read the Scripture to you. Everything is permissible, 1 Corinthians 6 says, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will be mastered 
by none. I will not be mastered by anything, Paul says. We have freedom, we have liberty, but we also have responsibility. We, we have to ask, how is this going to affect other people? That, that what I do and what I say is not just about me alone, but it's about how others are involved in it. What is my responsibility? So what is God saying? So right up front, if God says yes, I'm going to do it. If he says no, I'm not going to do it. But if he says yes, I move on to the next question. Next question is this. Is the timing right? Is the timing right? Do I, do I have enough time to think about this decision? How many of you ever gone to look at a car, to buy a car? And you just said, I'm just going to look. And then you drove off the lot with a car. And, you're, and you get home and you go, dumb, 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 dumb. Especially when you drove past the lot that had a cell on it. Or you, you know, you've never seen a car like that before and then you drove off the lot and you realize that 50% of the people in northwest Arkansas are driving the exact same car. And you can't find it when you go to the parking lot because there's, you know, 500 of them there. Is, is the timing is the timing right? And, and often what happens is, is we have to ask ourselves, do I have enough time to think about this decision? Do I, am I being pressured into a decision? A couple of weeks ago, I was in, in Wilmore, Kentucky, working on my doctorate there, and, and it was pouring down raining. We were at class, and we just had a break, and it was pouring down raining, and I was a little chilled in the room. They kept the air conditioner low. I mean, it was, they didn't want us falling asleep. It was meat locker quality. And, and so I thought, I'm going to run back to my dorm, my room, my the place where we were staying. And it's just, you know, a couple hundred yards. And I'm going to get my jacket or get my long sleeve shirt. And, and, and I got ready to go and it was pouring down raining, just pouring. So I waited. I, I thought, I'll just wait this thing out. So after about 45 seconds, I'm going, okay, this is not going to stop. You get impatient like that, you know, you think, if I wait, it'd be... so I thought, okay, I'm just going to run for it. So I ran, and by the time I got to my door, I was soaking wet. I go in, I get my umbrella that I can carry back out with me. I, I go in and change my shirt. I don't have time to change my pants or my shoes, and I go back out the door, and guess what? When I hit the door, it stops raining. <laughs> got my umbrella, snow rain. I walk back to the, to the room. It's cold in the room. I've got my dry shirt on, I got my wet pants on and my wet shoes on, and I'm freezing to death. Have you ever made a decision and you just got soaked over it because the timing wasn't right? And we have to ask that question, is this the right, is this the right timing for this? Do I have time to think this decision through? Am I going to be impatient here? Look at Proverbs 19, uh, verse 2. Enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. Haste makes waste, we say. Haste makes mistakes. The first question is, do I have time about this to, to think about this decisions? And some decisions need to be made quickly. We got to make them now. But some decisions, to be honest, we can just say, you know what? I'm going to think about that. My dad taught me, and, he, and your dad's probably taught you the same thing. You know, major decisions probably ought to be slept on overnight. You probably ought to wait before you make a major decision or a major purpose, uh, purchase. And you need to ask yourself, how much time do I have? Do I have to make the decision right now? But don't delay. Make the decision, but maybe you can wait a little bit. Second question as a part of the timing is this. Is this a good season? Maybe it's a, it's a great answer. It's the wrong time. Is this a good season for me? Is this a good season for my family? Is this a good season for my work? Is, this a, is, it, is the timing right you know, it's, it's usually not as important to make a decision as it is to make the right decision. Oh, but you just hurry up, make a decision, and it's not the right decision. Now, some of you avoid making decisions, and I recognize that. You're going, please make a decision. But if the timing is right and the season is right, just go ahead and do it. Don't wait on it. Just make that decision. You know, at Rogers First, we believe that the most important decision you can ever make is to make Christ the center of your life. To come to a place where you say, you know, I, I recognize I can't do this on my own. I need Christ to be my Savior, my Lord. And, and you do that. You make that commitment. 
And every week we give you that opportunity to do that. And, but we don't pressure you. We don't tell you you have to come now, you've got to do this now. God's speaking to you and we can trust that. And sometimes with decisions, it's okay to wait. Third thing you need to ask is this. What do I need to know? Not only what is God saying and, and is the timing right, but, but, but what do I need to know? In, in Proverbs 23, 23, it's a great verse. You ought to turn there. It's God's shopping list. If you're going to go shopping, you're going to get some things. Here's what God says you need to get. He says, buy truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. It says, buy it. Don't get rid of it, but, but get truth, wisdom, discipline, understanding. Find and keep good sense. How many of you know there's a difference between assumptions and facts? You've heard that. You've heard that if you assume, you know, that kind of stuff, right? I have a little sign in my office, and I, I got it uh, during my first pastorate. Because I grew up just, was, I'm one of those people I just kind of assume. I just kind of take it for granted. And, and in my first pastorate, I got into some challenges because I just assumed people would do things. I assumed that they thought this. I assumed. And so I found in the Christian bookstore a little sign that said, assume nothing. And it was the prominent place right above my desk. And every time I studied, every time I got on the phone, I looked up and there was that sign, assume nothing. And it's still in my office to this day. Because I think there's some wisdom there that there's a difference between assuming and getting the facts. What are the facts? Do I really understand what's going on? And, and it's okay to say, you know, I, I, don't, I doubt that. I, and to ask questions, what are, are my assumptions correct? And so what I'm training myself and I've been doing for a number of years is to ask that question. I'm assuming this. What am I assuming? And are those assumptions correct? It's a discipline and it's challenging for people like me to, to do that. But don't assume that everything is the way you think it is. Don't assume that even conventional wisdom is true. It's a delicate balance. The Bible says that we need to believe the best in everyone, but it also says we need to be wise. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. You know, a lot of times there's good reasons why we fail or other people fail in business or in relationships or whatnot is they don't, they don't get the facts. Well, I thought I knew. I assumed this but they really didn't do their due diligence. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15. Wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. So what does God say? Is it, is it the timing right? Who do I, what do I know? And then the fourth question is this. Who can I learn from? Who do I need to talk to that has made some similar decisions? Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Is that you? I have to tell you, sometimes I say, well, I'm right and you're wrong. And sometimes I've heard you say, no, I'm right and you're wrong. And, and the question is, are we being wise and getting advice and getting counsel from people? A wise advisor will say, you know, yeah, I think, I think you're right there. It makes sense. It's, it's worked out. And the best thing to do is to put some people around you that have a strength of, of strategic or a strength of execution or a strength of, of connection where they see how everything fits together and, and to get some wisdom from some different people with some different skills and talents and gifts and, and strengths than you have and to see what they would say. Sometimes they say, you know, you're, you're right, but it needs to be tweaked a little bit. Or maybe they're saying, you know, you're, you're missing this thing all together. I think you really need to rethink this thing. But you get wisdom from them. Proverbs 24, 6 says this, For waging war, you need guidance. And for victory, many advisors. You've heard of Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Automobile Company. He was asked one time about his success and, and why he was so successful. And his response was, wise decisions. And the guy interviewing him says, well, how do you make wise decisions? Experience, he said. Well, how do you get experience? Henry Ford says, bad decisions. <laughs> Your challenge and my challenge is we can learn a lot by making bad decisions and making mistakes. But what talking to others does is we learn from their experience so we don't have to experience it all to ourselves. 
We can learn from their mistakes. We can learn from their insights, and we go beyond where we are or maybe where they've gone because we're seeking out counsel and we're learning. Proverbs 20, verse 18 says, plans succeed through good counsel. You got to circle the word good. Oh, we can get a lot of counsel, can't we? I mean, you can post it on Facebook and get all kinds of counsel, but is it good counsel? And you say, well, I don't want to appear dumb if I ask this. I don't, you know, it's better to appear dumb than to make a bad decision and remove all doubt, right? Okay, ask questions. Who can you learn from? What's the target is the fifth question. What is the, the target? To understand what is the purpose and the reason for this decision that I'm going to make. Is this decision really even necessary? What am I pursuing? Because I need to tell you this. Listen to this. This is a very theological phrase. Some rabbits aren't worth chasing. Did you get that? Some rabbits aren't worth chasing. And so what is the target? Where is this leading me? And this decision that's before me, how is it going to affect me? And, and what is the real payoff here? What is the real challenge it's kind of like doing plumbing yourself. Is there really a payoff there? In my experience, there never is a payoff doing plumbing myself. Look at Proverbs 17, 24. Sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom, but a fool's eyes wanders to the ends of the earth. He said wise people think it through, but fools are just all over the place. What I put on your outline is, is this. It's It's a new way I'm trying to think over the past few months and trying to think through the ministries of our church and thinking through my life, uh, putting them through this kind of little decision grid of what is the target? What am I trying to accomplish? And, and it, it's very simply this way. If you'll notice on the top, it says easy, hard, and then on the side, it says small and big. Some decisions are, are really easy to make. They're just really easy, but the payoff is very small. It was a simple decision, but the response is very... And I'm not talking about financial payoff only. I'm talking about relational payoff or investment of my time and energy. Now, there's other things that, that uh, are easy, but they get a really big payoff. Boy, you put just a little bit of effort in and whew, big time. Or it has a small payoff, but it's really hard work. It just, it takes a lot of effort and energy, but the payoff was so small. Uh, a few years back, 2009, I did a series on home improvement. And I thought, oh, what I need is I need a notebook, and I'm going to make a notebook up with a neat cover and people's pictures from our church on it. It's just going to be about building a life, and my sermon outlines will be in it, and we'll have seminars. And I put all kinds of resources in this notebook, and it was a really cool half-inch big eight and a half by 11 notebook, and Sharon helped me put together the staff. We spent hours punching holes and copying and putting it together, and we bought notebooks. I think we made 125 of them or something like that, Sharon. And, and I, I got them out. I made them available a couple weeks before we started the series. I go, guys, this is it. You need this notebook to, on this series. I'm going to preach, and we're going to have seminars, and, and they're here, and they're only $3. It covers the cost of the paper and the notebook buy it on sale, and maybe not all of it. Didn't cover the cost and printing and all that kind of stuff. Well, out of 125 notebooks, I think we sold three of them. Wouldn't you say that that is a really, that was something that was really hard, high effort, high energy with a very small payoff. And so the next series I did, I said, forget the notebook. I'm not wasting my time and effort on it. We're asking the question even right now about the bulletin. And all the printed stuff we're doing in the church is this. It takes a lot of effort and time and energy to print the, the bulletin. There's cost of color and stuff like that. And so we're saying, well, maybe we need to change that because it's hard. It's a lot of effort. But the payoff may not. I ask my wife. I ask my staff. So did you read the bulletin? No. I ask all the leaders in our church. Did you look at the bulletin? No. Okay, we've got to figure some other way of doing this. Because we're, we're spending a lot of effort here, but we got very little payoff. And so we're updating the website. We're changing it all where everything is there. And we're going to be sending out an e-communicator different than what we have now. Instead of sending out all these individual emails where it's in a block each week. And so we're working on that. Trying to say, what is the big payoff? But it's the same in your life. Just because it's an easy decision doesn't mean it's a good decision. 
And just because it's a hard decision doesn't mean it's a bad decision. But you have to look at sometimes things are hard. We do a lot of things at the church that are hard and, and have kind of not necessarily a giant payoff, but, but they're just there, but we're committed to them and we do them. And there's some things that we do that are big that have big payoff. You know, we spend a lot of time on Bible walk, on vacation, Bible school, on ministries, a lot of effort, Christmas programs, Easter programs, but we feel like there's a payoff. Maybe not financially, maybe not in giant numbers, but in, in, in spiritual strengthening and growth. So in your life, it's the same thing. When, I, when I'm doing this, when I'm asking what's the target, it helps me and helps you center in when we kind of go through the grid. And we have to say, what is the vision? What am I trying to accomplish here? How am I going to get this done? Let me go on to the next, number six. And here's, I think, a very key question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? What are the long-term and hidden consequences of this decision? What does it really cost? Because you need to know this, that there's a cost to every decision you make. Whatever you do, there is a cost. You are exchanging your life, your effort, your energy, relationship, whatever. There are trade-offs. And if you do certain things, it means you've got to let other things go. Work on this doctoral program, I've had, to, I've had to begin to let things go from my hands, and I've been delegating more things, and, and I love our staff because they're phenomenal. And I say, well, okay, I'm going to do this, and Pastor George say, Pastor, Sharon can do that. Oh, Rob can do that. And I'm going, oh, but I'm so used to... No, they can do that. Why? Because I've only got so many hours and so much time. And so the question is, is what you're doing, the question that you're dealing with, the decision you're facing... Is it worth it? Is it worth the time and the energy, the payment that you're going to have to put out, the relationship? Proverbs 20, 25 says this. Don't trap yourself by making a rash promise to God and only later counting the cost. Is it worth it? You know, I have had to make that decision in my relationship with my wife when it comes to other influences and needs and things like that. I have to say, are you worth my relationship with my wife? Are you worth my relationship with my kids? Are you worth my relationship with God? And, and I say, no, you're not. Decisions made. I move on. Number seven is this. Who else is it going to affect? And that's tied in to, is it worth it? Will my decision harm other people or help other people? You see, a big mistake that we make is to underestimate the impact of a decision. The truth is we are connected and we have responsibilities. Romans 14 says, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. In other words, you may have a liberty. There may not be a command. And your liberty is there before you, but it's going to affect other people in a negative way. And so you choose responsibility instead of going with something that can harm somebody else. Think of it this way. If, you, if we were in a boat together and I drill a hole in the end of my boat, in the floorboard of my boat, and I drill a hole in my boat, does that impact you? Have you ever been in a boat before? <laughs> The truth is, if I'm in a rowboat and you're in a rowboat and I drill a hole in my end, it's going to affect both of us. We're both going to sink. And the truth is, a lot of your decisions are the same way. Who does it affect? And what's going to be the result of that? Parents, this is big for you. How you raise kids and what you do. Uh, Proverbs 27, uh, 20 verse 7 says this. The godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children who follow them. What a powerful scripture. The godly walk in integrity it means they live integrated lives. They, they live lives of integrity. And what they learn on the weekend, they're during, doing during the week. What they learn reading the Bible, they're doing in their relationships with other people. Do you ever know anybody that calls themselves a Christian and yet all week long live like they're of the devil? You ever had a Christian, Christian businessman come out that you really kind of thought, man, I want a secular businessman next time. Because at least, you know, I know they're going to try to rip me off. But I didn't think the Christian guy would, but he did. And sometimes it's better. You just wish sometimes people would not even use that name, not use that description. But the godly walk in integrity in our work 
in our relationships. And we have to ask, how do my choices impact other people? It could can, can be as simple as just going to a restaurant and how you act there before a waitress and you, you don't tip. And, and the truth is Christians are the worst tippers in the world, which is sad. My wife used to work and, and get tips all the time, and so she used to just beat me when we'd go out to eat. I had to leave a tip, and so I, I over-tip. I try to tip 20% whenever I go out because I know these people don't make anything, and they're serving me. And so I try to encourage them to serve me better and encourage them in what they're doing, and it's just tough. But sometimes Christians are the worst tippers of all, and, and you know, what happens if somebody invites that person to church, and they're, you're, they're, you're there, and they go, oh, is that what it means to be part of the church? To treat people like he treated me or she treated me? Because our decisions affect other people. That's just a simple, simple thing. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will refresh themselves. And I'm not talking, you know, pastors like to use that verse when it comes to church. Give, be generous, praise the Lord. But he's talking about life, just having a life of generosity, of giving, of being caring. The last one is this. What does God say? Is the timing right? What do I need to know? Who can I learn from? What is the target? Is it worth it? Who's it going to affect? And the last one is this. What am I afraid of? Because the truth is, when I get down to the end of it and all of those lined up and I can see that, that okay, it's all going to work out. I've got those seven questions and I feel like God's going, go for it. It, it, it. And I get down to the problem is, is this is the one that you'll face every time. You'll come to this place because fear is at the root of all indecision. Fear of making a mistake, fear of failure, fear of not being accepted, fear of what people are going to think of you, fear of embarrassing myself, fear of making a commitment, fear of, of being rejected because of the commitment I made, fear. And we don't like to admit it, but fear is at the heart of, of all indecision. You know Moses. Moses was called by God to go and take the children of Israel out of captivity. And, and, and instead of admitting his fear, he says, I, I can't speak. You know, Jeremiah, God called him to be a leader, but instead of admitting his fear, he says, I'm too young. You know, you know Abraham, he said, I'm too old. What's your excuse? God has a dream for you. God lays it out in his commands or in his principles or in the liberties or in the responsibility before you. And when you face decisions and questions and, and too many times fear debilitates you and you say I don't have enough time I don't have enough money I'm too young I'm too old I, I'm not smart enough what excuse do you make Proverbs 29 25 says this fear of man will prove to be a snare but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe you see perfectionism paralyzes potential and God, God is always in the job of using imperfect people in imperfect situations at inconvenient times. What's the antidote to fear? Faith. Romans 8 says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's a refrigerator verse. You know? If God is for us, who can be against us? What decision are you facing today? What is God saying? All the way down to what are you afraid of? Maybe today as we respond at the close of the message, maybe you just need to say, God, I need wisdom in a decision I'm facing right now. I, I, need, I need insight. I need guidance. And, and I need to remind you that the, the number one decision that any of us can make is trusting in God, trusting in, in Christ as our Savior. And, and most everybody here has done that, but there's some of you that are still not there. Uh, you know, you're not listening to what God is saying, or you, you, you don't know what your purpose is in life. You're trying to sort it all out. And, 
And during our response time, I invite you just to have an open conversation with God. And right now, allow the Holy Spirit to just speak to you. And, and as He does, just to be able to say, Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart. I want to be part of your family. I think another decision that we all face is the decision to be filled with God's Spirit. When we're saved, we're filled with the Spirit, but he doesn't, we get all of Him, but He doesn't necessarily get all of us. And we find out that as we walk as believers that there's still a self-will, there's still a human nature, that, a, a sinful nature that, that wants to do our way instead of God's way. And we can love God and we can want to serve God, and yet when the decision is made, it's my will or His will, we go with our will. And to be filled with the Spirit means that I surrender myself to say, yes, Lord, to you. And I no longer am controlled by the power of sin. It's not that I can't sin. It's that I'm not going to allow that to be the, God changes my heart, that that's not the ruling dominant force. Another decision is just to commit yourself to God's family, God's body. Some of you have been visitors for 20 years, you know, and you need to commit yourself to God's body, the church. Another decision is to find a place of service, using your gifts, growing in faith, and getting involved in Bible study and Sunday school and life group. Another decision is just finding a place to, to serve and share your faith. That there's people all around you that need, need what we have. You work with them, you live with them, you live around them. They need a church family. They need somebody to to say, I love you. And they need somebody that would just kind of walk them through and, and just be human with them. But be godly humans with them. Father, as we close our service out today, I've just tried to share practical truths from your word of how we can make decisions and, and that would be honorable to you because we want to follow you. We want to be pleasing to you. We want to be blessed by you. And too often the decisions we make end up in the negative and we're foolish because we haven't sought what you are saying. We haven't looked at your word. We haven't asked for your guidance and, and, and looked at the timing. We haven't dealt with the facts. We haven't asked advisors. We, we don't even know what the target is. We haven't even considered who it's going to affect. And yet we're so fearful. But right now we come before you. Because your word tells us that you know everything about us. You love us. You care for us. And you want to lead us. You told us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And not lean on our own understanding, but in all of our ways to acknowledge you. And your promise is you will direct our paths. And your word declares by faith that you will do it. And so today we receive by faith your word. Stand with me, would you? Do you need to just talk with God for a moment? Do you need to come to an altar of prayer? Do you need to say, God, here's the decision I'm facing, and, and I just need to ask you. I need to look at your word. I need to seek your heart. Maybe there's a decision you're facing. You say, I need to get some insight for some other believers who have been there. Maybe they can direct me to some people that can give me wise counsel. Maybe I just need to talk this through to find out what the real target is, and maybe I need to be honest with myself about the decisions that I'm dealing with and the choices that I'm making and how it affects other people's lives, that I don't live isolated, and my decisions are not just what I do and don't affect anybody else, but they affect others. And then am I afraid to just give it all to God, to make the commitment, to trust in Him, to do His will, or to turn away from something? Father, we love you today and how we seek your kingdom, we seek your will. We pray for the leadership of your spirit. We thank you for your word and your wisdom. Help us to make wise choices. 
Some today are in a valley of decision. And I pray that you would give them faith and wisdom to go through a process like this and and help them to find you. Thank you that you guide us and you never fail us or forsake us. And so by faith, by declaration of truth, we love you. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you go today, go in God's peace, go in His grace. Go in the work of the Spirit in your life to follow Him and be used by Him to be world changers. God bless you and give you grace. Amen. I surrender. Thanks, Jimmy. God bless you, buddy. What is this? I still want to.